Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Cantini. My name is Paul Herbert. I'm the director of the First Division Museum at Cantini. And this is obviously not the First Division Museum, but uh, uh, we have a summer exhibit, which we'll tell you about later, that's going up uh, in the room that we usually use. So we moved it over here, and that was wise to do, because we've got a standing room only crowd, which I'm absolutely delighted uh, that we do. In the event that you've never been to one of our events, and I know that many of you do, or if you've never been to Cantini Park, this is the historic estate of Colonel Robert R. McCormick, and he was the longtime owner, publisher, and editor of the Chicago Tribune and made it from a city paper to an international paper, an international media company, uh, and he lived here uh, at Cantini. He passed away here in 1955, uh, left all of his fortune to found our parent organization, the Robert R. McCormick Foundation, a major philanthropy uh, that's uh, headquartered on Michigan Avenue. Uh, and he said, leave my estate in Wheaton, Illinois as a public park for the people of Illinois. And so this is your place by his will in perpetuity, even if you came from Wisconsin, Indiana, or any of the other neighboring states. Uh, Colonel McCormick was intensely proud of the Midwest uh, and of Chicago and of the Tribune. And he was also intensely proud of his service as a citizen soldier in the first division of the American Expeditionary Forces in World War I. And when he returned from the war, profoundly affected as so many World War I veterans were, he named this estate Cantini in honor of a little village 75 miles north of Paris, France, where the United States fought its first battle for the freedom of Europe, the first battle in the history of the first division, the Battle of Cantini, May 28, 1918. Uh, that was fortuitous for us because the colonel was devoted to soldiers and veterans for the rest of his life. Uh, and when he left this estate, he didn't want his beloved first division to be forgotten. And so his first board of trustees created the first division museum. And the first division has been on continuous active duty. Not one day has gone by since June 1917, when they left for France from Hoboken, New Jersey, that we have not been served by the men and women of the Big Red One, the 1st Infantry Division. I was at Fort Riley, Kansas last week to welcome them home from a year's tour in Afghanistan. Their 3rd Brigade is deploying this week for another year in Afghanistan from Fort Knox, Kentucky. So it is a long and proud tradition, uh, and that's how McCormick, the Tribune, Cantini, the First Division, that's how all those things stick together, now you know. Uh, it, it's a great personal privilege for me to introduce tonight's uh, speaker. Uh, I don't think Rick really needs an introduction. Uh, this is, I think, his fourth or maybe fifth appearance here just in my time uh, at the First Division Museum, and he has been uh, just terrific about coming here as a speaker for all of his books, but also helping us uh, with some of the educational programs that we run for teachers and, and just a great, great friend of the First Division Museum. Um, he has recently completed, he's going to speak tonight about uh, the U.S. Army in World War II and particularly on the basis of the book that was released today, I believe, The Guns at Last Light, The War in Europe, 1944 to 1945, a subject in which we're intensely interested because of the very prominent role played by the 1st Infantry Division in those campaigns from D-Day to VE Day. Uh, that's the third volume in his trilogy uh, on that subject. The first volume was An Army at Dawn, received the Pulitzer Prize and acclaimed by the Wall Street Journal as the best World War II battle narrative since Cornelius Ryan's classics, The Longest Day and A Bridge Too Far. The second volume came out a few years ago, The Day of Battle, The War in Sicily and Italy, 1943 to 1944, and today's release completes that trilogy. Uh, there are a long list of other books and prizes uh, that Rick has achieved in his long and distinguished career. I'm not going to go over all of them. But I will mention that he served as a reporter for a correspondent and senior editor for 25 years at the Washington Post, in addition to being a phenomenal military historian. And he holds the 2003 Pulitzer Prize for History, the 1982 Pulitzer Prize for National Reporting, 
the 1999 Pulitzer Prize for Public Service awarded to the Washington Post for a series of investigative stories which he directed and edited. He also holds the 2010 Pritzker Military Library Literature Award for Lifetime Achievement in Military Writing. Uh, one of my uh, colleagues, as I was walking in here, handed me Saturday's Wall Street Journal. There is a long, long review of his current book in here, which is called The Great American Military Epic. It says, Rick Atkinson's finally judged trilogy is generous to the fighting GIs and unsparing of their commanders. Every student of the period should doff his helmet to the author for an exemplary battlefield performance. So I don't know how I can bring something better than that to this podium. <laughs> and it's also a great honor for me to say that Rick is a friend of Cantini, a friend of the First Division Museum, a personal friend. And so it is a great honor to introduce to you tonight the distinguished author, Rick Atkinson. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Thank you. I don't think I need this. You can hear me all right in the back, right? Good. So thank you so much for coming tonight. This is really fantastic. And thank you to my friend Paul Herbert uh, for that terrific introduction. Uh, I have been he here a lot uh, to speak uh, and uh, to do research because this is the finest division museum and archive in the country. And if you're interested in World War II, and I suppose if you're a scholar of World War I, you got to come here uh, because this is where the goods are when it relates to the first division. I have personal connections to the first division. My father, who was a career infantry officer uh, after enlisting in 1943, served in the first division uh, for four years in the mid-1970s. Uh, his closest friend in the army, a guy named uh, Marvin D. Red Fuller, I call him Uncle Red, he commanded the 1st Division at Fort Riley at the same time my father was stationed there. So I feel uh, a long and uh, emotional connection to the division. So thanks again for being here. My plan is to, to talk for a bit and then we'll open it up to your questions and uh, we'll have a conversation rather than a lecture. So Jack London said that a writer ought not wait for inspiration to come knocking on the door, but instead should light out after it with a club. <laughs> so I took my club 15 years ago, and, and what I came up with, what inspired me, was the Second World War. The war lasted 2,174 days, and by the end, it was the greatest catastrophe in human history. 60 million dead. That's 27,600 dead every day for six years, or 1,150 an hour. If you were a German boy born between 1915 and 1924, the odds were one in three that by 1945 you would be dead. The Soviet Union, with 190 million people, lost 14% of its entire population. 60 million dead over six years means one death every three seconds. One two, three, one, two, three. That's World War II. Now the writer Kingsley Amos once declared that he only wanted to read books that begin, a shot rang out. Well, my focus in writing a trilogy about the Second World War has been on the role of the Western Allies in the liberation of Europe, and in that tale, many, many shots ring out. The story is really a triptych. It's three panels that can be studied independently, but ultimately fit together to form a coherent whole. And the first panel for me, or the first volume, begins in North Africa, because that's where the liberation of Europe begins, and the first division, of course, is very much a part of that story, as it is in all three of my volumes. And it, that first volume consists of describing the war in North Africa from the landings in Algeria and Morocco in November 1942 through the fighting in Tunisia and ultimately the expulsion of the Axis forces in May 1943. And then we 
move north across the Mediterranean for the second panel or the second volume, and I describe the invasion of Sicily in July 1943, First Division, very much a part of that, as you know. And then the southern uh, Italy invasion in September 1943, and we see places like Salerno and the Rapido River, Cassino, San Pietro, Anzio, and on finally to Rome, which is liberated on June 4th, 1944. So this third volume begins on May 15th, 1944, and it opens in St. Paul's School uh, on uh, Hammersmith in West London. And we have Eisenhower, Churchill, Patton, Omar Bradley, King George VI, and a couple dozen of the most senior commanders who are going to be in charge of the invasion of Normandy, Operation Overlord, in three weeks. Together, in one room, it's called the Model Room, it was an amphitheater, to discuss, for the last time, the grand plan for the invasion. They're sitting on hard wooden benches normally reserved for schoolboys. The poet John Milton, among other English luminaries, went to St. Paul's. It's cold as a meat locker in the model room, and many of the generals are all bundled up in their overcoats, even though it's the middle of May. And on the floor of the cockpit of the auditorium is an enormous plaster relief map of the portion of France where the River Seine spills into the Atlantic, six inches to the mile. And there's a British brigadier with no skid socks on, and he's shuffling around on this enormous map with a pointer as the plan is discussed. And he's pointing to places on what will be the most famous battlefield in the world in three weeks, places like the beaches. So we have Utah, Omaha, Juno, Gold, Sword, and towns like St. Lo, and Cherbourg, and Cannes, and over there on the edge of the map, Paris. Then for the next 12 chapters, the action unspools at these places and others, Mortain, Falaise, Paris, the Hurtgen Forest, the first division was there. Antwerp, Nijmegen, Arnhem, and on through the bulge, the crossing of the Rhine, the encirclement of the Ruhr, and the final drive across the Elbe River to VE Day, Victory in Europe, on May 8, 1945. And as with the first two volumes of this trilogy, we move from a tactical foxhole view of combat periodically up to operational and strategic perspectives, and then back down. So much of chapter 10, for example, is set in Malta and Yalta in the company of Roosevelt, Churchill, Stalin, and their senior commanders. And we often take a peek on the other side of the hill to see what the Germans are doing. I also recount at some length the invasion of southern France on August 15, 1944, as well as the subsequent drive by that combination of French and American armies together up the Rhone Valley. They hang a right in Lyon, they go through the Vosges Mountains in the winter, and they capture Strasbourg in November 1944. And they are on the Rhine River four months before any of the other Western Allied forces reach the Rhine. It's a part of the war that many Americans know very little about. It's fantastic, and it's important to understanding the liberation of Europe, and the characters are spectacular. People like the American generals, Jacob Devers and Alexander Patch, for example, and the French First Army commander, General Jean de Lot de Tassigny, who is beyond the power of any novelist to invent. One admirer called him an animal of action, and he would appear in bivouacs in the middle of the night when his soldiers were sleeping, and he would roar out, what have you done for France? <laughs> He's that kind of guy. Well, as you may suspect, the liberation of Europe is not exactly an undiscovered subject. Amazon.com lists 
60,000 hardcover World War II titles. So how do you tell that story so that you and you and you are hearing it anew as if for the first time? Well, part of it is voice, of course, and narrative coherence, but part of it is certainly archival digging, spade work. And when it comes to World War II, an archive rat like me can live large in places like this, frankly. The U.S. Army records alone, one service, one country, U.S. Army records for World War II weigh 17,000 tons. That's a lot of paper. And no one has ever done more than scratch the surface, really. So, like all great events in American history, World War II is bottomless. There are wonderful things to discover, and that will continue to be the case, I'm certain, for some time. So, for example, I was at the National Archives in College Park, Maryland, not far from where I live in Washington, D.C., and I came across a document that was very interesting. It was of some interest to the First Division uh, when uh, June of 1944 rolled around. So, if you know that invading France is going to be difficult coming in by sea, because there are lots of Germans there. And if you know it's going to be very perilous to come in by air, by parachute or glider, what are your alternatives? How about digging a tunnel under the English Channel? And in fact, there was a study done. Someone had to brainstorm. Can we do this? And the guys, no doubt some iron majors, toiled away and they came back and said, sir, we can do this. It will take 15,000 miners, one year to excavate 50,000 tons of spoil. But we can do it. The one thing they couldn't figure out is what happens when that first miner pokes his head up through the hole <laughs> and the entire German 7th Army is waiting for him. So it went on the shelf. There was a whole set of issues about the invasion of Normandy. They had their own acronym, PINWI. Problems of the Invasion of Northwest Europe. I found, for example, there was anxiety that German aircraft would drop rats infected with bubonic plague on London. And so there were bounties offered for rat carcasses to test for plague in the spring of 1944. There was anxiety that the Germans would drop what were called radioactive agents on England. And so there were Geiger counters hidden all over London to be used as necessary to test for radioactivity. I found, well, in the, uh, the Allies stockpiled 160,000 tons, 160,000 tons of chemical munitions in England and the Mediterranean, just in case. And I found the two plans that Eisenhower had approved for chemical warfare in Normandy. There was one plan in which we cared about French civilian casualties in the event of chemical warfare. And there was another plan in which not so much. And it would have been absolutely devastating. There would have been tens of thousands of French civilian casualties had there been chemical warfare. U.S. draftee standards were progressively lowered as the war went on to eventually begin in inducting what were called physically imperfect men. So, for example, when the war began to be drafted into the United States Army, you had to have at least 12 of your natural 32 teeth. By 1944, how many teeth did you have to have to be drafted? Zero. <laughs> and that is because the United States Army and the Navy together drafted one-third of all the dentists in America. Collectively, they extracted 15 million teeth. They filled 68 million more. And they made two and a half million sets of dentures, all to enable GIs to be able to masticate the Army ration. I know that sounds like an obscene act, but that was the standard. <laughs> By 1944, a man could be drafted with 2,400 vision. By 
if it was correctable to 2040 in one eye. The old joke had come true that the Army didn't examine eyes, it just counted them. <laughs> and in fact, you could be drafted with only one eye. You could be drafted if you were deaf in one ear. You could be drafted if you were missing both external ears. You could be drafted if you were missing three fingers and a thumb on one hand, including your trigger finger. Venereal disease had kept men out of uniform for the first part of the war, but that restriction was lifted and soon the Army was drafting 12,000 VD patients a month, most of them syphilitic. How did they do that? Penicillin. That extraordinary discovery by British scientists in the 1920s of this antibiotic agent was followed by a massive effort by the Americans and the British to take a substance that had been made by the gram and to make it by the kilo and eventually by the ton. Why these extreme measures to fill the ranks? Because of the crying need for soldiers and particularly infantrymen and particularly riflemen. Even in a country of 130 million, we were running out. The Brits did run out. The war remained brutal and voracious to the very end. In April 1945, the last full month of the war in Europe, more than 10,000 American soldiers were killed in action in Germany. That's almost as many as had been killed in June 1944, the month of invasion. It was awful virtually to the last gunshot. So desperate was the American Army for infantrymen that the high command took an action that had been unthinkable just a few months earlier. They allowed black soldiers to volunteer for combat in white units. So 53 platoons of colored infantry were integrated into 11 otherwise white infantry divisions. And many of those African American soldiers surrendered sergeant stripes that they had earned as cooks, and drivers, and laborers for the privilege of fighting as riflemen privates. There are many other surprises and, and discoveries. I found, for example, and I've never seen this elsewhere, a detailed account written by the Atlanta funeral home director who was summoned to take care of the body of President Franklin Roosevelt after he died in Warm Springs, Georgia on April 12th, 1945. And the document is as powerful and moving as it is clinical. After several hours spent injecting six bottles of embalming fluid into Roosevelt's veins and arteries, and otherwise preparing him for eternity, this mortician summoned Arthur Prettyman, who was the president's valet, and had him comb Roosevelt's hair just so. I tell the story of one of the most secret weapons of the war, the so-called posit fuse, also known as the VT fuse. These were both code words. And it was a device in which, through brilliant American engineering, a miniature radar sensor was put into the nose of an artillery or anti-artillery shell. You're talking about something the size the shell nose the size of an ice cream cone, and it could withstand the extraordinary centrifugal and G-force uh, actions of a shell being fired out of an artillery tube, and it would emit radar beams as it was traveling upward or in a trajectory, and when it locked on a target, when it sensed an airplane, say, flying over, and the return from that radar signal came back and was received in the nose, it tripped a firing sensor and the shell exploded where you wanted it to explode. This was an extraordinary thing and we were soon making as a nation 20 million posit fuses a month for $20 each. They were first used by field artillery during the Battle of the Bulge in December 1944. The Germans called it pure manslaughter. I spent considerable time researching the C-46 
transport airplane, which was first used in the airborne drop in Operation Varsity Plunder in March 1945. That's the main crossing of the Rhine by British and American troops under General Montgomery in northern Germany. For reasons of cost and weight, self-sealing fuel tanks were not used in those C-46s, which had especially vulnerable fuel bladders and hydraulic lines. That self-sealing technology had been invented in the 1920s, and it was further refined after the reverse en engineering of German Messerschmitts that had been shot down in the Battle of Britain in 1940. So we could see how the Germans were doing it. And basically, you had two layers of rubber that lined the fuel tank. One was vulcanized and impermeable, and the other was more absorbent. And the latter, when a bullet would punch through it, would expand to plug the hole, sort of like blood clotting a wound. But there were no self-sealing tanks in those C-46s. And of the 73 C-46s that were flown by one air group in Operation Varsity Plunder, 19 were destroyed, most from catastrophic fires in the fuel tanks, and 38 more were damaged. It was a catastrophe of the first order. John Updike once said that World War II is the 20th century's central myth. He called it a tale of Troy, whose angles are infinite and whose central figures never fail to amaze us with their size, their theatricality, their sweep. Well, theatrical they are. I believe the narrative historian's true calling is to bring them back from the dead. And I try to do just that, not just with outsized figures you're familiar with, but with others who are less familiar, who have slipped into obscurity. People like the First Division's Brigadier General Ted Roosevelt Jr., for example, eventually lands in the first wave at Utah Beach with the Fourth Division, or General Lucian Truscott Jr. Many of these figures have been with us from the beginning in North Africa, Roosevelt and Truscott among them. Even amid the clash of army groups, my eye is always drawn to the small particular tragedy that illuminates the larger catastrophe. For example, the death of General Alexander Patch's son, Mac. General Patch commands the US 7th Army in southern France. And Mack was a young infantry captain under his father's command in the Seventh Army. And I tell the story using the general's letters to his wife, Julia, which are in the archive at West Point because Mack Patch is killed in October 1944. It's unspeakably heartbreaking. He's their only child. And General Patch writes to Julia, I cannot and must not allow myself to dwell upon our irreparable loss. As I write, the tears are falling from my eyes. Providence decrees, and we must obey. Providence decrees, and we must obey. I tell the story of the suicide of Rear Admiral Don P. Moon, who had commanded the naval forces at Utah Beach. And shortly before the invasion of France, where he again was to play a major role, he blew his brains out in the cabin of his flagship in Naples Harbor. The stress had unhinged him. And the suicide note that he left for his widow and his four children is haunting. And part of it reads, what am I doing to you, my wife and dear children? I am sick, so sick. We've last seen Lieutenant Colonel John K. Waters, who's a fine armor officer who happens to be George Patton's son-in-law, being hustled off to a German prison camp after he's captured on the first day of the debacle in Tunisia known as the Battle of Kasserine Pass in February 1943. In the guns at last night, we are reunited with Colonel Waters in March 1945, as a consequence of Patton's harebrained scheme 
his harebrained scheme to send a raid to the prison camp at Hummelburg in northern Bavaria, during which Waters was shot and severely wounded. I was given by his son, Colonel Waters' diary and his camp logs. He kept a meticulous log of prison rations, showing the daily allotments that included typically, for example, 35.7 grams of meat per man per day. That's a little more than an ounce. Plus 318 grams of barley bread, 200 grams of cabbage, and 143 grams of cow turnips. Waters carefully peeled the labels from Red Cross relief food cans, and he pasted them into this log as if to extract a few final calories from the memories labels of things like Topo peanut butter and Kroger's fruitcake. I mentioned that the United States during World War II had 130 million people. We managed to put 16,112,566 into uniform during the war. Of those 16 million, about 1.3 million are still alive today, my father among them. They're leaving us at the rate of 300,000 a year or about 800 a day. Think of a battalion a day, just like that. The number of surviving American veterans from World War II will slip below one million late next year, and 10 years after that, in 2024, the number will fall below 100,000. And in 2036, which is the last year for which American government uh, demographers have calculated or projected the figures, there will be fewer than 400 survivors of American, the American military that helped to win the most violent war in human history. They'll be reduced in the year 2036 to less than half the size of an infantry battalion. Well, this country suffered less than any of the other major belligerents. We finished the war with our industrial base not only intact but thriving. We finished the war with two-thirds of the world's gold supply, with plentiful energy, with optimism, a sense of a bright future. But about 400,000 Americans died during the war and 291,000 of them were killed in action. Nearly half of those battle deaths occurred in Western Europe in the last 11 months of the war. In 1947, the next of kin of all American troops who had been buried overseas, and that was nearly all who had died in the Pacific and the European and Mediterranean theaters whose bodies had been recovered. Those next of kin were given quartermaster form 345 and they were given a one-time option in 1947, whether to bring home their dead soldier or to have him buried in one of two dozen American Battle Monument cemeteries overseas. About 40% of the survivors elected to leave their soldier overseas, and about 60% chose to bring them home. It cost $564.50 for every repatriation. It was something only a rich, victorious country could afford. Every grave around the world on six continents was opened by hand, and the remains of every dead soldier was sprinkled with a compound, an embalming compound of formaldehyde, aluminum chloride, wood powder, clay, and plaster of Paris. And then the remains were placed in a steel casket with a satin pillow. Labor strikes in the United States caused a shortage of casket steel, and there was also a shortage of licensed embalmers. And in warehouses at places like Cherbourg and Cardiff and elsewhere, the dead accumulated. But finally, the SS Joseph V. Connolly the first of 21 ghost ships from Europe and the Pacific sailed from Antwerp 
with more than 5,000 soldiers in her hold. On October 27, 1947, the Connolly birthed in New York. And stevedores winched the caskets out two by two in specially designed slings. And a great diaspora began as these dead and those that followed traveled mostly by rail across the Republic for burial in their hometowns or in national cemeteries. Among those waiting was Henry A. Wright, a widower, widower who lived on a farm in southwestern Missouri near Springfield. One by one, his dead sons arrived at the local train station. Sergeant Frank H. Wright, killed on Christmas Eve, 1944, in the Bulge. Then Private Harold B. Wright, who had died of his wounds in a German prison camp on February 3rd, 1945. And finally, Private Elton E. Wright, killed in Germany on April 25th, two weeks before the war ended. Gray and stooped, the elder Wright watched as the caskets were carried into the rust rustic bedroom where each of those boys had been born. And neighbors kept vigil overnight, carpeting the floor with roses, and in the morning they bore the brothers to Hilltop Cemetery for burial side by side by side. That's how the dead came home. But what of their belongings? What of the things they carried? Even before the dead came home, these things had been coming back. At a large warehouse on Hardesty Avenue in Kansas City, the U.S. Army Effects Bureau had begun as a modest quartermaster enterprise with a half dozen employees in February 1942. That expanded to more than 1,000 workers. And by August 1945, they were handling 60,000 shipments a month, each laden with the effects of the American dead from six continents. Hour after hour, day after day, shipping containers were unloaded from rail freight cars that pulled up to a siding next to this warehouse onto a receiving dock, and then they were hoisted by elevator to the depot's 10th floor. And here the containers traveled by assembly line conveyor belt from station to station down to the 7th floor as inspectors pawed through the crates to extract pornography ammunition, letters from a girlfriend you didn't want to see, be seen by a grieving widow. Workers used grinding stones and dentist drills to remove corrosion and blood from helmets and web gear. Laundresses scrubbed the uniforms, trying to get them clean. And then a detailed inventory was pinned to each repacked container before it was stacked in a storage bin. And all the while, in a huge adjacent room, banks of typists pounded out letters, up to 70,000 a month by the middle of 1945. And the gist of those letters was this. Dear sir, dear madam, we have your dead son's stuff. Where should we send it? Over the years, the Effects Bureau found tapestries, enemy swords, German machine gun, Italian accordion, walrus tusks, a shrunken head, a tobacco sack full of diamonds. Among thousands of diaries also collected in Kansas City was a small notebook that had belonged to Lieutenant Herschel G. Horton, 29 years old, from Aurora, Illinois. Shot in the right leg and hip, during a firefight with the Japanese in New Guinea, Horton had dragged himself into a grass shanty. And over the several days that it took for him to die, he wrote a final letter in the notebook. It began, my dear sweet father, mother, and sister, I lay here in this terrible place, wondering not why God has forsaken me, but why he is making me suffer. Our current poet laureate, Natasha Trethway, ends her poem, Pilgrimage, which is about a visit to Vicksburg with these lines. In my dream, 
the ghost of history lies down beside me, rolls over, pins me beneath a heavy arm. My ambition as the author of this trilogy is for you too to feel that heavy arm, to feel the palpable presence of those who risked everything and in some cases gave everything for us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. And please put it in the form of a question. <laughs> OK. Question. Over here, sir. Welcome back. It's good to see you again. What is the great unanswered question that you have found in your research that you still want to know about this time period that just boggles your mind and you really want to know what happened? It's not whether. Dwight D. Eisenhower was sleeping with Kay Summersby, believe me. <laughs> um, you know, I think anybody who has spent, as I have, 14 years studying this, and who, uh, as I have, I was born in Germany, I lived in Germany for several years as a correspondent for the Washington Post, uh, I remain mystified, as 80 million Germans today do, uh, over the Germans. I remain mystified how one of the most cultured civilizations ever, the culture of Mozart, Brahms, Mendelssohn, Goethe, could get themselves into this predicament. How they could be mesmerized by that Austrian. Um, I can give you many rational reasons to help explain it as the Germans can, and there are rational reasons, but ultimately I think it's irrational. And I think when people are looking at this war 500 years from now, that will remain one of the great mysteries, how the Germans, how this could happen in Germany. Right here, hang on just a second. Why do you believe Eisenhower went along with Montgomery's Market Garden plan? Could you hear him in the back? <laughs> <laughs> um, I believe that Eisenhower believed, as almost everyone else did in September 1944, that the war was virtually over, but there were disquieting signs that perhaps the Germans would be able to make a last stand of some sort and, and bring things to a halt. Now, remember the setting. We've been bottled up in Normandy, we meaning the Brits, the Americans, and our allies, been bottled up in Normandy until August 1944 when the breakout occurs beginning at St. Lo on July 25th. And then we race across France and the Germans are reeling. And they are a shattered, fleeing shadow of the armies that had been in, in Western Europe. And yet, when they reach the West Wall, there are some signs that they're going to be coherent enough to make it difficult for us, and that we're not going to be able to punch through, in part because we're outrunning our logistics. We're running out of the ability to get enough gasoline. We've got plenty of gasoline, we just can't get it where it needs to be. And there are other logistical issues. So I believe that Eisenhower felt and was persuaded by Montgomery that essentially outflanking the Germans by going around the northern end of their west wall with this bold, breathtaking, extraordinarily uh, flamboyant plan to drop three airborne divisions and then to have a, an armored corps essentially drive through on a single road through these airheads that have been captured, 
that in fact it was worth the risk. And I think, think in fact they minimized the risk. It was a nutty idea. <laughs> it, was, it was poorly conceived. It was poorly executed, not for lack of valor, for sure, but poorly executed because if you've ever been in that part of the Netherlands, you know that it is crisscrossed with canals and, and river obstacles and, and water obstacles of all, all sorts, that there are a sequence of bridges and you must capture all of them or you must replace all of them if they've been blown. You can't get eight out of nine because you can't get the armor force through Arnhem and then on to the Zyder Z in order to outflank the German forces that are there. That bold, imaginative operation, Market Garden, fails on the first day. It's over on that Sunday when the airborne drops occur because they have not captured the many obstacles that they need to capture. So it's, it's done. Now, Eisenhower is not a very good field marshal. He's not a great captain. He's not Napoleon. He makes many mistakes during the course of the war, beginning in North Africa and continuing in Sicily and on into Western Europe. He does not see the battlefield spatially and temporally the way a great captain must. But that's not his job. He is, in his phrase, chairman of the board. His job is to organize and to hold together, despite all the centrifugal forces that are at play, the largest martial enterprise on Earth, this fractious coalition. And he's brilliant at that. So I can say that Eisenhower is at fault on any one of a number of occasions when it comes to battlefield deficiencies, allowing 40,000 Germans and Italians to escape across the Straits of Messina from Sicily, for example, in August of 1943. Shouldn't have happened. Allowing enough German forces to escape from the Falaise pocket in August 1944 so that they have the kernel of a real resistance force, including most of their senior commanders. He doesn't impose his will on the battlefield as a great captain must. And when he's offered this plan by a normally very cautious field commander in Bernard Montgomery, it's kind of breathtaking. Eisenhower, incidentally, at that moment when the plan is first presented to him, he's unable to walk because he has hurt his knee, his, his ostensibly good knee, not the one that he'd hurt in the game, army game against Tufts, which bothered him for his entire life. But he had wrenched his knee, probably tore his meniscus, as we would know today. Uh, and so he was immobilized for almost two weeks at an absolutely critical time in the battle for Western Europe. And so he flies to see Montgomery because Montgomery won't come to see him. And he's very indulgent of Montgomery. And he flies to see him. He can't even get off the plane. He can't even get out of his chair on this plane. And Montgomery, first of all, they have a big row for an hour over various things. But then Montgomery mentions almost as an aside, I got this idea. And there had been a succession of, I think, 17 or 18 various plans to use this airborne reserve. They were coins burning a hole in the pocket of the American High Command. British Airborne Division, the 101st, the 82nd. And Eisenhower says, let's, let's do it. Let's try it. Let's go for it. And it's thrown together very quickly. It's September 17th, which is that fateful Sunday, is only a few days really after he's approved the plan. So I think he's, he's beguiled by the, the, the allure of rolling the dice and by his own, fr frank, uh, frankly, his own shortcomings in not, not asking the right questions. That's a, that's a really good question because it's an important part of the war. Yes, ma'am. Um, 
For all his faults and failings as a, as a uh, commander, could George Patton have been better utilized in, in uh, the war in Europe? Well, he would say yes. <laughs> Look, George Patton was lucky to be in Europe. I mean, let's review the history for a moment. Uh, slapping two soldiers in two separate events on two successive Sundays in Sicily is not acceptable behavior for a senior commander. One of those soldiers was in the first division. And had he been an American commander today, first of all, 50 reporters wouldn't have sat on the story as they did then. And they did it as a favor to Eisenhower, not to Patton, because they didn't really like Patton. And the high command would not have tolerated it, nor should they. So he's lucky to be in the game. And then he has other, you know, more minor mishaps. But uh, he is in the game. And so how is he used? He's used, first of all, to deceive the Germans. Because even though they're not terrified of him, this mythology that, you know, this is the general that the Germans most fear, that's not really the case. But they're certainly aware of him, and the brilliant deception, multi-layered deception that goes on before the invasion of Normandy on June 6, all known as Operation Fortitude, which is, the Brits run it because they are masters of duplicity. And this has the Germans thinking that Patton is waiting, even after June 6, 1944, with this reserve army group that, in fact, the main invasion force is yet to come. The Germans think there's another 30 divisions waiting probably to come through the Pas de Calais. And they think, I, I think Patton is going to command it. They believe this until well into July. Some of them believe it until August, when already you know, the breakouts occurred. So that's very useful. Now, when he actually gets over there, and incidentally, he offers Eisenhower, what is it, $1,000 a day for every day in advance that Eisenhower will let him come into the theater before the prescribed date. He's, a, he's wealthy, so um, he, can, he can afford to make that kind of uh, offer. But uh, he shows up and... He helps to organize, in a very meaningful way, the breakout after the bombing at St. Lo. And he's out there directing traffic through Avranche in the traffic circle. It's not what you usually want your lieutenant generals to be doing, but it's what needs to be done. And so that breakout is something that I think, you know, he, he gets part credit for the, the brilliance of getting through Avranche and basically sending the Germans on that reeling defeat uh, that ends up at the German border. The rest of his contribution is significant. He doesn't see that the, the, the master plan to take Brittany, because they need ports, they need ports, they need ports. You cannot run this big industrial strength invasion of army groups without having big industrial strength ports. And so the plan is, and Cherbourg isn't big enough, and it's been utterly wrecked by the Germans. So the plan has been to take Brittany and to take the ports in Brittany, including Brest, and to build an artificial port on the southern coast. And that's Patton's job, is to take Brittany. He's slow to see, as is Eisenhower, and certainly as Bradley is, that that's not the game anymore. I mean, it's 500 miles from Brest to the German border. That's not going to do you much good, even if you capture the port intact, which is unlikely. So he's slow to see that. But once he gets gone, once he gets turned in the right direction, it's a pretty masterful drive across France. Now, I think his biggest uh, contribution is in the Battle of the Bulge. He takes his third army and essentially pivots a good part of it 90 degrees in the dead of winter to drive into the flank of the German penetration and to rescue the 101st at Bastogne and to begin the counteroffensive against the German offensive. And this is, a, this is brilliant. It's brilliant staff work. He's got a very good staff. 
He's got a really good intelligence officer, among other things. They're the only ones uh, who really have an inkling that maybe the Germans are going to do this, this, uh, this crazy scheme of attacking through the Ardennes in the middle of December. So, you know, I, th I think you know, hats off to him. Could he have been used between uh, the invasion of Normandy and, and there better? I don't, you know, hard to say. Counterfactuals are tough. I think he's used probably pretty appropriately. He's clearly not, uh, I think, cut out to be an army group commander. I think. I'm not sure of that, to be honest. But, and then for the rest of the war, after the bulge ends in late January of, of, uh, of 45, you know, he's, he's a driving George, you know. Uh, he's doing his thing. And, uh, he, he's admirable. He's, he's very good. He is a battle captain. But I don't see that there's, uh, you know, that the war would have been demonstrably different had he been used in a different way. Sir, in the very back. Thank you. As long as we're on Patton, in the fall of 1944, he relieved General Woods uh, of the 4th Armored Division and replaced him with General Abrams. Uh, every time I've tried to research why that happened, I can't find an answer. Are you aware of an answer? Do you have an opinion? I mean, General Woods was the winning quarterback by the fall of 44. His men adored him. And it's like taking the quarterback out in the third quarter and replacing him. Why did he do that? Yeah, I probably don't know any more than you have if you've really dug into it. I, uh, you know, P. Wood uh, was a difficult guy. Okay, so it was George Patton. Um, Wood was the one who recognized as they're swinging into Brittany that, uh, you know, hey boss, we're going the wrong direction. Germany's that way. He wants to drive to the east and the force under Patton with Bradley's certain concurrence is going to the west to take these ports. And Wood is really insistent on it. Uh, he sees this quite clearly. You know, there's, uh, I think Wood was, was really tired by the time he's relieved. I think that's quite clear. The relief of general officers in general uh, is precipitous. The first army, which is the main American fighting force, you know, the drop of a hat, a general officer is yanked out of there, sometimes with cause, sometimes with less cause. In the 90th Division, you know, they have two successive commanding generals relieved, it seems like, in hours. Ted Roosevelt is supposed to command the 90th Division. He never knows that Eisenhower has approved his command of that division after that second division commander was relieved because he drops dead of a heart attack. And I am so sorry when I have to say goodbye to him in this book. So Wood, uh, like many, is really tired. He's very obstreperous. Uh, he, he's, he's fighting with his corps commander. Uh, the Corps commander gets to the point where he's just had this, and he says, basically, either he's got to go or I've got to go. And uh, usually in that kind of tug of wills, it's the guy with more stars on his shoulder. In this case, they both had two stars, but one of them had clear seniority. So um, I'm sort of sorry, because he's really a wonderful character, and I. I you know, I would like to have written about him more, but he's, he's gone. Over here, sir, right in the back. You, with your hand up. That's it. Hang on just a second. Could you, dis could you discuss uh, the liberation of the concentration camps? Yeah, and I do. I write about it a fair amount in here. Um, I mean, it's interesting that even though camps had been overrun earlier. The Russians overrun Majdanek, for example, in, uh, in eastern Poland, and there are reporters with them. There's a Time magazine account of Majdanek, which is a death camp. And it's kind of the, the scene that we've, in 70 years, become accustomed to with piles of eyeglasses and suitcases of those who have been sent to their deaths in this camp. And we overrun uh, Natzweiler, which is in uh, near Strasbourg, in Alsace. 
Now, most of the prisoners there have either been killed, and it's not a big death camp, but there's a lot of evidence, and this is in November of 1944, of experiments which are done in Strasbourg by the University of Strasbourg, uh, medical experiments on Jewish prisoners in particular. And uh, Roosevelt starts, I mean, he, there's a huge controversy that's been raging for 70 years over the abandonment of the Jews, as one book was titled, and whether or not Roosevelt and Churchill and other leaders were um, vigorous enough in, uh, first of all, trying to liberate the camps earlier or bombing the camps or, or, or uh, making the world aware of these camps, but in fact, there was a fair amount of publicity about this, and it didn't stick in our collective imaginations, that of the American people and the British, too. Uh, and the reason for this, in part, was that there had been very lurid propaganda in World War I about atrocities committed by the Germans, and people were very skeptical of similar propaganda stories. So it's not until April 1945 when the first big camps are being liberated in Germany, that the world kind of wakes up to it. And part of it is because there are film uh, crews there. And all of a sudden, in movie houses where they had been reluctant to show uh, atrocities of any sort because they didn't want to scare away the movie going public, and they put aside those scruples beginning in 1945, May, April 1945. And showed, for example, the liberation of Bergen-Belsen, liberated by the Brits, and all of the horrors with it. So there's a succession of liberated camps, and it's all awful. And words can't begin to describe it. I try, Elie Wiesel has tried. You know, it's, it's hard to convey exactly how awful it is for a 22-year-old private from Wheaton, Illinois, who's in Dachau. Now, part of the liberation of the camps includes atrocities by us. And Dachau's a case in point. Two American divisions arrive there, more or less at the same time, and they see awful things. They not only see thousands and thousands of emaciated inmates, but they also see hundreds and hundreds of bodies lying around, including many in a train that's on a siding next to the camp where the, the prisoners who have been shifted from another camp to get away from the Russians have, have, been, have starved to death. And it's beyond horrible. And American soldiers went on a rampage, as did a number of the inmates. The inmates literally tore from limb to limb some of the camp guards that they caught. And American soldiers, executed SS guards who had surrendered. There are photographs of them being lined up against a wall and mowed down with a machine gun. There were two episodes in particular at Dachau, and there were at least a couple dozen, probably more than that, who were murdered. There was an investigation done. The IG documented it very carefully. No one had an appetite for prosecuting these soldiers for murder, even though murders were committed. And there are reasons for that. Guys are being sent home. Units are going under different commanders. Uh, uh, nobody ha has the appetite for it. So, you know, the liberation of the camps is a, a glorious thing on one hand. It's part of the reason why the war is fought. GIs may not have known it at the time. But bearing witness to what they saw and all the horrors that the war contained that is somehow encapsulated in those camps as part of the responsibility of the soldiers who came home afterwards. But it's also horrible because there were episodes where uh, American soldiers behaved badly. And that's part and parcel of war. There's a lot of killing of prisoners by both sides. Um, that begins in Sicily, particularly with the 45th Division, which had been the Oklahoma and New Mexico National Guard. And it certainly intensifies in Normandy. The first division is not immune. Hey, so, one more okay.
You got the last one. Hang on, sir. Have you thought about the irony of the fact that it was German scientists who came to this country and developed the nuclear weapon? And what would have happened had they stayed in Germany and developed it for Germany? Would we have lost the war? Well, that's another counterfactual, so it's hard to, I, you know, I can say yes, and I can be right, and I can say no, and I can be right. But um, sure, the uh, exclusion from German society of Jews in particular, who had a scientific bend, like Albert Einstein, uh, was a windfall for the forces of good. There was great anxiety about how far along the Germans were on their atomic program. I mentioned the, the capture of Strasbourg. And there was a special unit called ALSOS, A-L-S-O-S, -S, which was tasked specifically with going to Strasbourg and determining whether or not, because there was a German laboratory there at the university, whether or not Heisenberg and other German scientists who had stayed in Germany and were very much a part of the German war effort had really made advances to the point where we needed to worry about them having an atomic bomb. And the top German scientists that we were after, there was a guy named Weisseke, whose brother eventually became president of Germany, uh, and Heisenberg and others got away, but they left most of their papers behind. And when we were able to determine in short order, and these papers were sent to Oppenheimer and Alvarez, guys who were helping with the Trinity Project uh, out at Los Alamos, and they were able to determine very, very quickly that in fact the Germans were not as far along on this project as we had been in 1942. It was a great relief. And there's a good paper trail on it. It's a really interesting part of the war. Uh, uh, so if those German scientists who emigrated had stayed in Germany, would they have been farther along than we were in 1942 in November 1944? I, I don't know. Uh, you'd have to ask it, probably a physicist. Uh, probably not significantly. I mean, the last point I'll make about this and it's related to this, but it's a larger point about global war. It's often argued, my friend Max Hastings, who wrote the wonderful review in the Wall Street Journal that uh, Paul alluded to, will argue, for example, that when one American company fought a German company or an American battalion or regiment fought a German battalion or regiment, that Germans tended to be tactically superior. And my answer to that is, that is completely pointless. Tactically superior. Well, the Germans certainly had a genius for tactical warfare. They're really good at it. And if you've got to fight them to take this hill or that hill, if you're the first division at Aachen and you've got to fight them for Aachen, or if you're trying to get up on the bluff at Omaha Beach, pardon the expression, it's a bitch. Because they're really good. But in the larger scheme of things, it is pointless because global war is a clash of systems. Which system can generate the combat power? Which system can generate the logistical capabilities, the transportation needs, the manufacturing ability to produce 100,000 airplanes a year? Which system can produce the trucks and the bombs and the machine gun bullets and the posit fuses that I talked about? Which system can project power? The Germans could not cross the English Channel, which at its narrowest is 21 miles wide. They could not muster the wherewithal to do that to invade Britain. Whereas the United States projected power into the Pacific, the Atlantic, the Mediterranean, Southeast Asia, all the heavens, the seven seas. So talking about one regiment against another regiment, 
or talking about it on a technical level when you are discussing and trying to understand global war is really irrelevant in understanding how World War II unfolds. That's it. Thank you so much. So as, while Rick was talking, you were thinking of questions you could ask. I was thinking of comments I could make. I'm not going to make any of them. Uh, <laughs> because after all, this is World War II, and it was documented with 17,000 tons for the United States Army alone. <laughs> and we could be in here all night, and we're not going to do that. But what a, what, a, what a wonderful talk. And what a master of, somebody asked me today, does he need a screen and a PowerPoint projector? And the answer is no. And I think we all learned a tremendous amount without that technology. I, I got a couple announcements I got to make. You got an evaluation form. Uh, please fill it out and leave it with one of our folks in the back. Uh, through the beneficence of Colonel McCormick, you came here free for something you'd pay a lot for in some other venues. So take a little bit of that spare change that you saved and drop it in the red, white, and blue mailbox with the Legionnaires at the table in the back, and we will see that it goes to the Larson House in Wheaton, the Midwest Shelter for Homeless Veterans, a wonderful nonprofit grassroots organization that's trying to solve a real problem for our veterans. I would ask you to do that. Come back Saturday, May 18th, it's Armed Forces Day. You can talk to some of the current soldiers of the 1st Infantry Division in the Illinois Army National Guard. We're proud to have them here. Uh, you got a little flyer in there about our summer exhibit. It's opening soon, Faces of the First. It's absolutely terrific. I hope you'll come see it sometime this uh, summer. Uh, this is going to be kind of like a wedding, although that has nothing to do with Rick and I. We're just friends. <laughs> but when this is over, he and all of you are going to stay seated. And you're not going to come up here and ask him any questions. And you're not going to fill up the pathway between here and the exits in the back because I got to take him back into the lobby. As soon as you see us pass Tom in the Legion cap back there, okay, then, then it's okay. All right. If you want to buy his book, they're for sale in the gift shop. If you have a book, you want him to sign them, he'll be in the lobby. He'll be glad to do that. Please be a little sparing of his time because I think there's going to be a, a long line there. But let us get out and get set up for that because we could all stay here and, and talk with Rick, I'm sure, uh, all night. Uh, JD, what else, what am I forgetting? What else should I announce, anything? Does that sound like it covers the waterfront? Yeah, okay, so we're very delighted to have you here and uh, we hope you enjoyed this presentation. Rick, we've, you've been here so many times, we've given you just about everything we can think of. Uh, but we had, uh, so we put everything else we could think of in this sack. <laughs> And this is your prize for later, but one of the things you get is this really cool hat that I hope you'll wear at the Pritzker Military Library tomorrow <laughs> <laughs> that says First Division Museum at Cantini. So uh, w w once again, uh, let, me, let me hand you that. Put my microphone over here. And say how much I greatly appreciate a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. service. I normally have all the veterans stand up. I'm not going to do that. Is there a World War II vet here? Please stand. Mm -hmm.